Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us on another ASDA Inside presentation. Um, today we're going to be talking about social and environmental determinants of health. My name is Kristen Horstman and also joining us. My name is Kenya. Uh, Kristen and I are classmates. We're a class of 2022. So we are technically third years and we're yes. happy to have you here. Welcome. Welcome. Perfect. So today we are going to be talking about, um, it's a really big topic to cover, social and environmental determinants of health. So we're going to kind of split it down into um, environmental injustice, the causes of social determinants of health, um, and then even more specifically, uh, Ksenia is going to be talking a little bit about immigration, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about food deserts. So social and environmental with both of those. So, um, like I said, my name is Kristen Horstman. Um, I'm originally from Fresno, California. I graduated from Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles back in 2017 with a degree in biomathematics. But I actually started as an environmental engineering major, so I've always been very interested and passionate about the environment. Um, a big reason of this is because I grew up in the outdoors all the time. Um, I grew up like a mile from the San Joaquin River, um, volunteering down at the river, cleaning up at the river. Um, I grew up in the summers up in the mountains of the Sierra Nevada. So envir the environment was always very, very important to me. And I didn't really realize until I came to Los Angeles how privileged I was and how I had taken nature and living in such a great area for granted um, until I saw you know, the, the inequality that different communities face. Uh, hi, my name is Ksenia Bulukina. I was born and raised in Moscow, and I moved to San Francisco to follow my dream to be a dentist. Uh, initially, for the first time, I came in to actually study English. My English, believe it or not, was pretty poor about eight years ago, but today I'm really uh, fortunate and um, feel really blessed to be here and giving this talk to you. I graduated from National Research University Higher School of Economics with degree in psychology and psychotherapy. And uh, social determinants and different social issues were always uh, top of my interest after dentistry, obviously. And uh, uh, relationships in general in people and communities play such a crucial role for us as human uh, species. So, you know, we, Chris and I thought that would be very interesting to tie together something that has to do uh, particularly with health, social determinants, and environmental. So let's start a little bit with the uh, key determinants of health. It's uh, like Kristen was saying, it's a really, really complex issue, and that includes many basically five key factors that um, we discovered. And uh, on top of economic stability, education, social and community, neighborhoods, employment, food, all this is condition, overall the conditions in the places where people, social determinants of health, the condition where people live, learn, work and play, and they affect a wide range of health risk and outcomes. And this condition are known as social determinants of health. Um, a large and compelling body of evidence has accumulated that particularly during the last two decades revealing that more powerful role actually falls on social factors, uh, for example, apart from medical care, uh, in shaping health across a wide range of health indication and uh, populations. So those are, if we look at the resources that enhance quality of life, like safety, affordable housing, public safety, social support, et cetera. And we think about it, how it shaped our personal lives. Where do we live? Where, where what's, what, what is in our neighborhood? How far do we walk to a park? How far is a school? So all those things can really determine what your life is like. I don't know if I took it for granted, but I grew up in a city, so everything was really around all the time at the tip of our fingers, but some people have to travel really far away, especially when they don't really have um, access to care. Thank you. So first we're going to start with the concept of environmental injustice. So environmental injustice is considered the disproportionate exposure of communities of color and the poor to pollution, and it's 
concomitant effects on health. Um, recently, this has been discussed lots as environmental racism, um, which is definitely accurate as well. Uh, the more technical term is environmental injustice because it affects um, the poor too, regardless of their race. Um, but I'm probably going to be going back and forth with using environmental injustice and environmental racism because they really are one and the same. So um, this figure here um, is called the Kuznets curve and we consider it Kuznets curve of environmental. And it's basically the idea that there's an inverse relationship between pollutants emitted and how affected a group is by that. And this relationship follows how wealthy that group is. So interestingly, the poor socioeconomic classes are usually the ones emitting the least amount of pollutants. They walk, take public transportation, um, you know, reuse, recycle, everything like that. But they tend to be the ones most affected by both overall environmental impact and individual impact within their homes. So like unsafe living conditions, um, lack of clean water, um, unsafe houses, uh, excess chemicals in their area, whether it's in the air outside or in you know, the products they use because it's the cheapest. Whatever it might be, usually the poor are the most affected by it while they emit the least amount of pollutants. The middle class, um, which is the peak of the curve, um, could be better with how their habits are, um, but they're also usually affected by community. Um, level contaminants like air pollution, so something that kind of affects the entire community as a whole. Meanwhile, the wealthiest populations live in the best neighborhoods, the safest homes, the cleanest hair, air, the newest technology, but they disproportionately affect our environment the most with private jets, wasteful consumeristic behavior, or you know, even owning the corporations and the factories that are taking advantage of the environment around us. So, um, they don't really see the issue with, you know, the environment because it's not affecting their daily life, but they tend to be the ones who are abusing it the most. So the concept of environmental injustice was first discussed in the 1960s um, in a article called Toxic Waste and Race, published in 1987. Or, I'm sorry, it was first discussed in the 1960s, but the article Toxic Waste and Race was published in 1987 and brought the topic to a more widespread um, audience. So this was really when people started understanding the importance of the environment and how, you know, happening to ourselves and the um, lower socioeconomic classes affected by this. Um, meanwhile, in this article, it specifically found that race was the single most important factor in determining where United States toxic waste facilities were located. So even at the very, very beginning of this movement, they found that race was actually connected to the concept of environmental injustice. So where exactly is this happening? Um, so this graphic here um, talks about how Detroit, Michigan has one of the most populated um, zip codes and it's in a neighborhood that is 80% black um, South Los Angeles specifically found that 9% of residents live 500 feet of a truck route. So just right out their window is a truck route, a freeway, um, and just constantly breathing in that air pollution from, from these vehicles. 8% live 500 feet from a manufacturing facility, and there's still 51 active oil wells um, operating in residential neighborhoods. So you could just drive into South LA, um, Watts, Compton, wherever it might be, and you are seeing um, just how different, especially with us in Westwood, um, their neighborhood is in comparison um, because everything is kind of pushed into that neighborhood. And then in Michigan, um, I just mentioned uh, pollutants, but I would say that more commonly, um, probably the most, other than maybe um, the Dakota Access Pipeline right now and the Standing Rock protests from a few years back, I would say that the most um, well-known 
issue of environmental racism is going on in Flint with the water crisis. Um, they still don't have clean water. It's been, I think, five years, four years. I don't have that number off the top of my head. But um, in even the report from the Michigan Civil Rights Commission, uh, the people of Flint have been subjected to unprecedented harm and hardship. Much of it's caused by structural and systemic discrimination and racism that have corroded your city, your institutions, and your water pipes for generations. And I just thought this quote, which was from the government itself in Michigan, was really powerful to say that there was racism systemically and it was just corroding away at the city. And yet, even with recognizing it, no one is helping. No one is really speaking up for that and um, making a change here, um, even with the Michigan Civil Rights Commission noticing this. So in short, everywhere, um, we also have the Isle de Jean Charles, I don't speak French, sorry, but I'm assuming that's French, in Louisiana and um, where it's affecting the Native Americans there. Um, you could walk down you know, the beaches in Los Angeles and see um, you know, oil spills. And so, there's environmental injustice everywhere. Um, it's really important that you start examining your own cities and neighborhoods with a critical eye and start noticing, you know, where's the cleanest air? Where's the cleanest water? Where's even just the best parks? Um, and you're probably going to notice that it's usually in the white neighborhoods, the richest neighborhoods, and it really doesn't have to be, but that's kind of how the system has come to play out. Next slide. Oh, thanks. Um, so, no, 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 sorry. I was looking at the wrong thing, sorry. Um, so it was lagging for me. Um, so the evidence of this is um, all over. There's a ton of articles about, um, about how the environment and racism is, racism is tied together. Um, and it was found that long-term exposure to air particulates is associated with racial segregation and the level of exposure actually directly increases with the level of segregation. So the more segregated, the you know, more white the neighborhoods are, the cleaner the air pollutes, or the cleaner the air is. The more diverse a neighborhood is, the dirtier the environment is. Um, and this graphic I know is very overwhelming. I promise you those red boxes are really all that we want to focus on. On the left is where these studies were taking place. So this is a big collaboration of several different studies. And we have Los Angeles, the state of Ohio, um, the state of Oregon, the state of Florida. I mean, all over, um, all over, all tons of different cities, tons of different states. And um, it's really not just one specific area. It's definitely a national problem here. And then on the right, it is comparing, um, is there a correlation to race? And most of these are saying yes. Um, most of these are saying that yes, it is disproportionately affecting um, communities of color and lower socioeconomic status communities. So um, more evidence here that I just thought was really important to bring up is that Hispanics um, have more than two times the amount of chlorine exposure than whites, and this has been found time and time again to affect cardiac vascular function. Um, and asthma rates in black children are double the asthma rates in white children. Um, so, I mean, there's definitely lots of evidence here. And it's environmental injustice everywhere. I mean, there's leaching of pollutants into water in both urban and rural communities. So urban, like we were talking about with Flint, um, chemicals from you know the streets and the pipes and port infrastructure can leak into the water but then also rural communities like central california where i'm from um, the leaching of um, pesticides and chemicals to grow the land that um, is leaching into the water of the very farm workers who are working to grow our own food and are being affected by their own work because that's where they have to live basically so there's a lot of evidence of this um, all over, tons of different articles about this. 
Okay. Um, so you might be thinking, or some people might think um, that, okay, well, correlation isn't causation. Non-whites tend to live in less desirable neighborhoods. It's not racist, but there is a lot of racism, systemic racism from this to begin with. Um, the whole concept of redlining, which could be an entirely new presentation in and of itself. We could go on for that for a few hours as well. Um, but in LA specifically, the history of redlining is that it forced minority populations after, the, after World War II and this economic boom into these neighborhoods where they then placed factories, waste disposals, um, toxic waste management facilities, and made sure not to place those into the same neighborhoods where white um, people were living. And then that just continues. Um, it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy where you're going to keep continuing to put these facilities here and then keep these neighborhoods safe, clean, and healthy. Um, also, these placements are human decisions. Um, politicians and corporations are choosing to harm these predominantly minority neighborhoods. They are choosing to place them into neighborhoods that often don't have the resources, time, or voice to speak out and are making sure that they're protecting the richer neighborhoods um, from the placements of such structures because they know that there would be too much uproar, too much hassle, too much money for them to not, um, for them to avoid getting those um, facilities placed there. So this quote of a focus on poverty to the exclusion of race may be insufficient to meet the needs of all burden populations. I thought this was really, really moving because, um, you know, we can't just ignore, we can't just ignore that there's a link with races. Um, it's something that we need to confront head on if we're trying to fix this issue of poverty and inequality. Um, you really can't ignore um, all the different aspects of it. So what can we do about environmental injustice? So it was actually found in a couple of articles that the most effective way to combat environmental racism is by using the same strategies of the civil rights movements. So legal funds to fight back and protect their neighborhoods, public meetings and marches to protect, um, to empower and educate um, just the general public, and then also citizenship schools for environmental education. So citizenship schools are kind of a lesser known aspect of the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s and it helped teach African-American adults how to read, but it connected the politics of the time in the movement to what they were learning how to read. So there's this whole concept of bringing back citizenship schools. Luckily, um, illiteracy has declined, so it'd be less about that, but more about um, you know, teaching about the environment, about our, about um, how the local, government works. So that way people can kind of start understanding their rights and um, the science behind it as well. And like, wait, this isn't right. This isn't fair. Um, so just kind of a little unique way to educate the communities that need the most help. Um, so then the Green New Deal, obviously, <laughs> I, was, I was going to try to not get political, but then obviously this entire whole talk and the environment itself ha has become a little bit political. And I think that that's, that's insane to me personally, that you, you can politicize the very earth that we live on um, and that everybody breathes the same air. But um, the Green New Deal is a new policy um, introduced by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And there are pros and cons to it. I'm not gonna go into it too much, but um, the main goals are to make the U.S. carbon emissions net zero, and it does mention racial injustice within the environment. It mentions the poor communities, the minority communities, and how we can try to fix this with economic green choices. Um, so there's definitely a social aspect within this environment and within the policies. So I'm not saying that this law or this you know bill is perfect, but um, definitely we need to start fighting and being on the lookout for. Um, more ethical and environmental policies here. 
So uh, we're switching gears back to social determinants of health. And uh, as you might have seen, that we talked about the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, and work. And those circumstances are truly shaping uh, the distribution of wealth, power, and all the resources that gives us an opportunity to get education and to be treated and see a doctor. The social determinants of health are more, uh, mostly responsible for health, like I was saying. The unfair and avoidable differences in health status that uh, within the, uh, between, the, we can see between different countries. So a little bit of history about the guy who actually did a little bit of research. His name is Thomas McCone. McCone. He is a Scottish physician who studied death records for England and Wales from mid to 19th century through early 60s. And he found that mortality from multiple causes had fallen steadily decades before the availability of modern medical care, such as antibiotics and intensive care units. So he attributed the dramatic increase in life expectancy since 19th century, primarily to improve living conditions, improving nutrition, the access to water, that Kristen uh, touched upon a little bit. While advances in medical care also may have contributed, uh, we, most author and ourselves, we believe that non-medical factors, including condition with the traditional public health, play not maybe less, but even more important role. Uh, the relationship between social factor, factors and health, however, are not simple, and there are active controversies regarding the strength of evidence supporting, because it's a little bit hard to measure, in particular, to take the pool and population and look throughout the years and uh, try to um, discover the fundamental causes of the wide range of health outcomes, because there, there are just so, so many evidence. Speaking of which, Explain. Uh, let's look at the evidence together. I know it's a little bit uh, complex slide, but if you look to the left side, we look at education. That's, I would like, by this slide, I just wanted to make an emphasis that I chose, I thought was the most important and how we find correlation between education, family income, and how we bring it all together uh, on the right bottom slide. Uh, graph. So if we look in the left, the bigger graph, we can see how work, health, knowledge, uh, literacy, and uh, different uh, social beliefs and traditions, diets, all of this, all the social things that we find in our life, all brings us to health. And it's inevitable because if we think about, okay, I'm going to go to a grocery store. What do I buy? Do I look at the a label? Do I look at what's in it? Do I know the names of all the ingredients that are included in that? But also, the, uh, Kristen is going to touch on that a little bit later, the quality of food plays a really big role as well. So if we look at the in family income to the top right, the percentage of children under a year of um, 17, uh, we, we can see that the income and the wealth is correlated. So the, the more money people have, the better health they have. And on the bottom right, we can kind of see it but divided by race and income and, uh, and education. So, and, and the darker, um, darker graph, we can see that it's a level, uh, the less than high school. So we can see that, the, of course, the top, graph shows that these people have uh, call it some sort of college, college degree. So, and this is, this shows us a strong correlation between education and just an interesting fact to look across minorities, how that influenced them as well. So most edu importantly, education aspect um, inevitably leads to health and uh, their factors into fam family income and our income do, so those factors influence family income or is our income influence our health and education? Uh, let's look at the next slide and think, what can we see here? So I, ch I chose these two maps in order to show the distribution to the left of people who have high school diplomas. And uh, to the right, we can see uh, the population of different minorities. And you know, 
let's just leave it in that because I'm going to come back just you can see that the distribution of different minorities, blacks to the right and mostly on south, and then Texas more green, it's a Hispanic population, and to the right in California. And then we can look at the high school diploma levels. And it's very interesting how those colors are so similar in terms of darker in that particular areas for people who actually don't really have that much education. Next slide. So how can we make a change? During the first half of 20th century, uh, the leading cause of diseases and death in the US, which includes typhoid, were associated with unhealthy living conditions. The second part was basically dedicated to increase focus on clinical and non-clinical preventive strategies. For example, immunization, smoking cessation, and healthy eating and exercise. And although spending on America spending um, so much money on medical care and have higher than any other nation, the US, the US has consistently ranked at near the bottom among influent nations on key measures of health, such as life expectancy and infant mortality. So the effect that we can look at that, for example, effective communication, what we're doing today, for example, we're trying to frame this message from a different perspective and see what do you guys think about it? So we, Kristen and I thought that would be interesting if we look at it from the perspective of that we never experienced. And we think that it's really important to bring it up and talk about things like that. And as homo sapiens for us, narrative is, was the first, um, history book was written by a narrative from word to word. So that's how this is, helps us to bring awareness and change a strat one of the very successful strategies. And of course, of course, visual imagery. Most of us are dentists and we remember and probably if we close our eyes, we can see how class two looks like. So it's something that it's really easy to convey to public. And if we use those strategies, we can reach out to different populations and make them basically aware of what is going on. Another uh, thing that we found uh, important is, uh, of course, access to health food, effective parenting, and safe neighborhoods. As I stated previously, if we look in our window, we probably can see trees, we can let our kids outside, our dogs, no problem. We're not too worried about what is going on. We can walk freely but some neighborhoods don't have that luxury and that influences greatly the way they have to behave around their neighborhood and within their families so and uh, lastly as healthcare workers we are the key resources for local state and national policymakers and crucial issues for health equity for all americans because for some we're the first source we uh, uh, for example, CDA cares. A lot of people stay in line till, since 4 a.m. to see us. And we might be the first healthcare professionals they see in years. So it's all in our power to actually make a change. So as um, I stated previously, immigration, myself, I'm an immigrant, as um, you might not be surprised by the, my personal introduction. And I thought that immigration is a great example of social determinant of health because um, we, you know, when I came to the US, um, the rules are different. Everything is different. The language is different. And, uh, you know, being an immigrant, it's scary because you don't really know it. What if you make a mistake? People will kick you out of a country. Um, you know, I, I chose to talk about it because it's, um, uh, also, not only personal topic, but it's it can deter. It's an example of both the result. It shows the how we can start from scratch, basically moving into new community, new society, and there are so many factors that are included that determines the health, social determinants of health, such as employment, housing, living condition, access to food, social services, legal status factors, and they can really make a change for a lot of people. Um, you know, as the immigration nowadays flows increasingly worldwide, the social determinants of health surround, uh, surround the many individuals who choose to or are forced to leave their homeland for survival, for work, 
society, so, social life, and in some cases, even, even war. Uh, but unfortunately, um, when we arrive, myself, when I arrived to America, I um, purchased health insurance, but, um, you know, it's, um, public health is a, it has a profound influence on immigration. And um, it actually plays a huge role in social determinants of health and immigration. There are not sufficient dialogue, you know, there are not insufficient dialogue for as of today. And as we discussed previously, immigration is a process that is both the result of factors like employment uh, and the legal status and, and the well-being. People who immigrate, you know, from different countries to America, they have different um, baseline of healthcare. For example, if I move if I would have moved from Canada or Germany, I'll have a very different understanding of what social services are. And it's really important that actually um, access to those services would be provided for people, for minorities, and for people who come from different countries seeking a better, better life. Uh, second slide, please. So here I chose this um, beautiful graph that basically brings it all together and you can see it might look similar to the graph that you saw in the previous lecture and at the beginning of our lecture today where we can look at the all the all the factors that are linked together such as separate separation from your family but it starts from the core your style for lifestyle factors social and community that influence you living and working conditions for example uh you know if we as a dentist think, okay, people come to us and they're missing a tooth and they're not going to be able to find a job there. They have a low self-esteem and people, for example, if you go and work as their cashier and you probably won't be able to get that job, unfortunately, because people have certain standards and, you know, you represent, you, you know, it's, it plays a big role in people's self-esteem, them self-esteem and it can determine what positions you can get if you live in unsafety neighborhood uh, and you have construction next door to you uh, it can greatly influence your sleep um, and it can um, you know exacerbate health vulnerabilities and um, um, finishing up with the immigration topic uh, due to lack of legal status uh, you know stigma discrimination language culture culture barrier and low income levels uh, you know it's uh, it's it's scary uh, sometimes you don't know who to turn to who you can ask a question what if you're not doing it correctly please next slide so um, since we are dentists, we decided to talk a little bit about determinants of oral health, and we uh, learn about it in our first year of dental school, how much actually um, income and level of education plays a role in oral health. And um, uh, as we can see in the graph to the right, uh, people who actually go and see a dentist once a year have at least 50% of them have a college degree. and 55% make good money. So it's not only expensive, but it has to, you know, you have to know that, for example, when you have a baby, that you have to go and see a dentist when they're one year old to establish the dental home. So there is a lot of things that are have to be taken to consideration and uh, the ability to, not only the ability to access uh, oral health, but the efforts that we need to overcome those barriers are in our hands. So because the mouth is, a, is both a cause and a reflection of individual and population health and well-being. Next slide. So here, uh, as I stated previously, I wanted to come back to this slide after we talk a little bit about social determinants of health, immigration, and other factors that are included. Let's tie it all together and refresh our memory by looking at the racial distribution and the level of education one more time. Do you see correlation or is it me? How can we address social determinants of health? There is, um, you know, a growing recognition that the places where individuals live, live, work, 
learn and play significantly influence their oral health. Addressing this social determinants in the community can lead to improved access to oral health care, utilization, and outcomes. And here we can see that minorities are being affected not only because of level, they, they might not have facilities or schools, they might not have enough resources to even place their kids in schools, and they are affected the most in this distribution. Thank you. So I think I found the answer. Uh, what is the value of social determinants of health and dental education? I think it all comes from dental school, how we learn, what we learn. Training, I think it's a good solution to train future dentists and identify and address health uh, disparities to promote health, health equity is it's a key factor. Other health disparities are not merely the difference in oral health status between the social classes, but are a recognition of, uh, of power differentials related to factors such as race and ethnicity. So here we're grateful for mentors like Dr. Hewlett here who is um, on this picture leading by example and bringing, bringing diversity and education to underserved communities and population where that volunteering was um, was taking place next factor so how can we address the social determinants of oral health now most importantly we need to identify the social determinants of health in our, our community as a in the previous slide, you can see we can map and mobilize available community resources and uh, create partnership. And as you can see on this picture, there are so many factors included into the determinant of oral health that, you know, we were able to, um, you know, evaluate each factor and make a change. And, uh, and select different approaches, as we discussed previously, in order to to um, address it in our community. Especially, it's really important to allocate our resources as dentists. We can create fundraisers. We can, uh, in social and public health policies, we can organize um, uh, dental, you know, um, in, disadvantaged, in the disadvantaged community, we can go to mission trips. And uh, most importantly, we can advocate. Like we, for example, and ask that we go to um, Washington DC to advocate for certain laws. So I believe that we can make a change. All right, so then, um... Also with social and environmental um, kind of ties it together and we're going to be talking about food deserts. So food deserts are defined as areas where access to affordable and healthy food options is restricted or non-existent due to the absence of grocery stores within convenient traveling distance. So there's two different definitions of, um, of deserts. We have our city deserts, which are greater than one mile from a supermarket or grocery store. And then we have our rural deserts, which are greater than 10 miles. So pretty big disparity here, but a lot of people in cities maybe don't have cars, don't need cars, um, but they still need to have um, healthy options within a walking distance. And this map here is actually locations of food deserts around the LA area. So those at the very top, that's kind of more the desert, that's gonna be more rural, probably um, greater than 10 miles away from um, the nearest grocery store. But then down at the bottom, um, we can see, you know, the Los Angeles that we're somewhat more familiar with, those of us who are attending UCLA. And um, even in Long Beach, South LA, downtown, there are food deserts where people are um, just too far from the store to be able to get the um, nutritional food items that they need. So according to the USDA, 17.3 uh, million United States citizens live in low income areas and are greater than um, one mile away from a supermarket. So if you don't own a car, um, and especially if you have a multi-person household, traveling that distance with just holding the groceries that you have um, is gonna be really, really taxing and really difficult. And it's also, um, 
takes a lot of time. It's this whole concept of um, wealth of having time. If you're able to even go grocery shopping and then take the time to walk back um, with all the groceries that you need for yourself and your family. And even this number might not be as statistically accurate as it should be, because according to the North American Industry Classification System, which is used by the federal government to count um, food, uh, food producing stores, um, all of these stores, so all of these so stores are the counted exactly the same. So if up. any store sells food, whether it's a corner store, a Whole Foods, a Target, or the dollar store, those are all going to be counted exactly the same. So you could live, according to um, the government, in a non-food desert area, but that's really just because there's two corner stores next to you um, that sell you know, chips and soda and maybe a lone banana like on a good day. So um, even with these numbers, we really need to look at the numbers um, pretty critically to make sure that, okay, just because it says that there's a location that sells food, it may not be the healthiest option of food. And um, on top of that, we have a big difference in financial costs between healthy food and non-healthy food that makes up the food desert. So this picture um, is kind of silly. It's from Netflix's show, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, um, Tina Fey's show. And there's an episode actually where they go to um, Titus, the male in the picture has scurvy because he doesn't have access to fruits and vegetables. Um, and they go to their local store where they buy um, a salad, which is really just chunks of bread. It's a French bread salad. Um, it was, it's a great episode. I watched it as my research for this slide. Um, but um, the cost of buying healthy food in these food deserts is really, really burdensome. Um, corner markets pay three to 37% more than suburban supermarkets. So even if you were able able to go to Ralph's, but a lot of people don't have that luxury. And then between 1989 and 2003, the cost of produce increased by 75%, but then the cost of junk food dropped by 26%. So that wealth, I don't wanna say the wealth gap, but the gap between um, you know, being able to buy healthy produce and junk is just getting bigger. It's getting easier to access these junk foods and harder to access the food that so many people need. So unhealthy foods are cheaper in the short term, but this often leads to costly medical burdens down the road. So it's really more expensive um, later on. So who is being harmed by food deserts? So unsurprisingly, kind of the theme of this is that they are more frequently found in low income and minority communities. Um, white neighborhoods were found to have four times as many supermarkets as predominantly black neighborhoods. So there's just this abundance of access in a lot of the neighborhoods that, um, you know, richer and wider neighborhoods are living in. And even if there are grocery stores in black communities, usually they're found to be smaller and with less selection. So um, doesn't really even necessarily take into account if you have, um, you know, special needs with um, certain kinds of food like gluten-free or dairy-free um, and may not have exactly what people even need because they tend to be smaller. And then these same demographics that are most likely to be found in food deserts all tend to have disproportionately higher rates of type two diabetes than white people. So, um, and more commonly even is in youths. This was really found a lot in Native American youths. Um, the levels of type two diabetes are spiking and these are definitely found to be correlated to living in food deserts because they just don't have access to healthier foods, but they have an abundance of access to junk food and fast food. Um, so implications as health professionals, so kind of as health professionals overall, like I said, those in food deserts have a higher rate of type 2 diabetes, but then also was found to have higher rates of obesity and cardiovascular conditions. 
Um, the death rate from diabetes in food deserts were found to be double that of other areas. So you are twice as likely to die from diabetes if you live or grew up in a food desert than you are if you um, live elsewhere with access to fresh food. Um, and then of course, us as dentists, we know that processed sugary and starchy foods are more likely to cause dental caries. And then the foods that are a little bit harder to access, like fresh vegetables, lean meats, um, that are good for our teeth, not really able to get. So that's a big reason why we see more dental caries and food decay in households that are in food deserts and in households with food insecurities. Um, it's a pretty obvious gap between not having um, enough money or enough access and the level of caries and tooth decay. So what are some solutions about food deserts? Um, so this graphic, we have the concept of community access and empowerment. Um, so access is a really big one. We have thinking creatively, just kind of thinking of different ways that we can get food to um, these neighborhoods. So we have co-ops um, where people can work to get, um, instead of payment, to get some fresh food and um, they bring in fresh foods into these neighborhoods. And then there's bus station farmer markets where usually farmer markets um, are, you know, on the prettiest streets, the most picturesque, the most Instagrammable, whatever it might be. But bus station farmers markets are the concept that they bring the farmers markets right to the bus stop. So those who rely on public transportation can just have their food right there and then get on their public transportation to get that food back to their home. And then um, getting creative with the alternatives to fast food. So um, these two companies, Every Table and Local, are actually LA-based companies. Um, and they try to offer healthy, on-the-go, not fast food, but fast food alternatives. The meals are about $5 each and you can get, you know, like a taco bowl or grilled chicken and salad. Um, so $5, a lot cheaper than, you know, if you were to go to most places that sell healthy options, still not sustainable in the long term for a lot of these neighborhoods, but a really good creative and good first step to getting alternatives out there. Nutritional education is also huge for trying to fix food deserts because there have even been some research in um, the, that they found that when, even when some of these neighborhoods were given fresh produce, um, a lot of times they didn't even know what to do with it because it's not something that's used to, you know, being in their, in their life. Um, so nutritional education of, you know, easy, simple, fast recipes and how to use this produce and how to even cook sometimes, um, is really important, you know, once we get past that access step into empowerment and education. And then of course, we need to put pressure on the local government and businesses to open and support urban grocery stores, as well as rural grocery stores, um, because they are a little bit harder to keep in business, but it's really important that they're there for the people who live in these areas. Um, so just in general, environmental issues as is dental professionals, so just the environment in general and food deserts, um, it's really important that we start making environmentally conscious choices inside and outside of the practice. I think that dentistry is a naturally a very wasteful profession. We have a lot of one-use disposable, um, you know, PPE and, um, you know, um, one-use syringes, well, of course, one use syringes, but one use um, equipment that we just toss at the end of the um, procedure to make sure that we're keeping, um, you know, high quality standards of infection protocol and infection control. So because of that, I think that we need to be extra cautious of like, okay, if I'm producing more waste than normal in my work life, then how can I scale that back either by using, you know, more sustainable practices in your daily life or by making sure that you're using the most ethically sourced um, choices in your daily life. Also, it's important that we empower our communities. Um, 
every single community that we uh, that we could have any access to that we could understand really important to get out there and we give back with our food services voice fundraisers whatever it might be but just finding that power and giving it back to the community and it's really important that we educate on the importance of healthy food choices and i think that a lot of dentists might be like oh well i do that but if you work in the private practice in the private sector usually it's going to be people who kind of know what they should and shouldn't be doing but just maybe don't want to like okay maybe i shouldn't have a soda every day for lunch but i really love it so i'm going to do it anyways so it's really important that we go out to schools and like Senya said, uh, CDA CARES events are great um, to health fairs to make sure that we're getting this education and getting this privilege of knowledge out to the general public and those who might not know. And this picture I actually took at a health fair that we went to in um, South LA, it was just east of Inglewood. And this little girl who's brushing the Dodger mascot's teeth she was so into the idea of dentistry and she wouldn't leave the table the whole day to the point where like we had to kind of like sneak other children over so that they could learn because she was just hogging the table so much. So, I mean, people are wanting to learn. Children and adults um, both are wanting to learn about oral health and, you know, how to stay healthy because no one, no one wants to be unhealthy. Nobody wants to have decayed teeth, but they need to learn the steps to get there. And then my last point here, don't be a Walter Palmer. So um, Walter Palmer is probably not a super familiar name to most people, but this is the dentist from Minneapolis who a few years back went on a hunting trip in Zimbabwe and killed um, Cecil the lion, who's like a 15 year old icon of the country basically. Um, hunting is a different story, um, not talking about hunting here, but I think that with this story, I think that dentists have almost become the butt of a joke. And um, the whole concept of like, oh, well, you know, Midwestern dentist going and kind of like being selfish, doing whatever he wants and kind of, you know, taking advantage of another country. And because we're a profession that one, people don't really understand for the most part, and two, gives us a pretty comfortable life. Um, I do think that we've become a little bit of this I don't want to say that we've become a joke, but I think that the whole concept of, you know, um, this particular man has become this thing that we really need to try to fight back against and need to be actively conscious to fight and understand that um, we can't really be selfish with the power, that being a well-educated, um, hopefully financially comfortable um, person gives us. We, we can't be selfish with that. We really have to give back to our communities and not take. Um, so what can we do just in general? Um, I know that Sunny and I have talked about this a lot, but there's a lot. I mean, we could do politics, finding and voting for ethical politicians and propositions for both social, um, immigration, environmental, whatever it might be. Um, as cliche as it is, using your privilege, um, it's really important that, you know, whatever you find that's your strength, whether it's your voice, your connections, generosity, whatever you have, um, to give back in that. And then the community empowerment. <laughs> it's uh, my dog. Yes, <laughs> me. Anyways, I'm sorry. Uh, and community of empowerment, of course, as uh, Kristen was talking about, um, the funds that we can create and public meetings, marches, and citizenship schools. For example, uh, we just observed it a couple months ago how much power we have in the community as we all were brought together and we can make a change, as well as bring awareness into our community. And uh, multilingual documents in communities, education of all groups can be very, very useful. And I experienced this firsthand. And for example, recently, um, for our PEDS clinic, we, uh, the program translate coordinate, coordinators for translation, they started to making documents and uh, all the curious awareness forms for every, every languages, including Russian, which was very fun to do. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that um, Kristen and I strongly believe that we can make a change together.
Definitely. So help happens in neighborhoods um, just straight into the point. I mean, it start like Senya said, it starts from the very core of where you're living, um, your neighborhood, whether it's environmental or social, it's really important for us to just look around and see what we can what we can fix here. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, do you have any questions for us? Hi, my name is Yesenia and I have a question.